Good evening and welcome to Chatroom. The Cleaning the Air resource for schools was launched by the Hawke's Bay Regional Council just recently. It's been developed to go along with the Heat Smart program and to tell us more about it from the Hawke's Bay Regional Council, Heat Smart program coordinator Mark Henney. Hi Mark, welcome. Good evening. Now tell me whose clever idea was it to develop a program for school children because it's kind of getting the message in early, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm. Um, the Heat Smart program originated in 2009 and at that time we considered how best to communicate. So this has been quite a long time in the making this resource because we always felt that it would be appropriate to get into the schools to make uh, the issue of clean air something relevant within the curriculum of the schools. So it's been three years in the making. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, who developed it? You're a part of the development team? Yes, absolutely. Um, as with most good things, you look around and see what else there is in terms of resources nationally and then you heavily plagiarise it and take credit for it later. Um, the Bay of Plenty Regional Council did a lot of work on it, so did Greater Wellington, and Christchurch have got a, a lot of excellent educational material. We've taken bits of it and personalised it to Hawke's Bay and the issues that we have in Hawke's Bay with air quality. Mm. So scientists have been involved, obviously you've had teachers involved as well? Yes, mm. um, we had originally uh, through the community engagement program and our communications team at Hawke's Bay Regional Council, a team of people putting the information together and collating it. We then trialled it on some very kind teachers um, who gave us some excellent advice on how to trim it down. It started off about this thick and it's now come mm. down to something more manageable. Mm. What about the areas that were covered? Did, did the teachers input in that or, or how it was being taught? Well, part, part mm. of the, um, the structure of the resource is that it matches the curriculum from the schools. So there are elements of uh, mathematics, science, uh, literature, etc., mm. that all tie in with the curriculum. Mm. And the teachers were invaluable in showing us how mm. that link could mm. be made. Now, it's specifically aimed for years four to eight. Mm. Was there a particular reason for that, that age group? Um, years four to eight are heavily influential on their parents. <laughs> um, and we wanted to make this a, a learning tool, not only for the school, but for the home as well. And kids, when they take something home that they're enthusiastic about in terms of experiments um, that they can involve the parents in, uh, they love it. And mm. the parents like it as well. The feedback we've had has been really good. Mm. Well, after having a look at the resource myself, you know, I've certainly learnt some things already. Inversion layer, for example, and the inversion layer over Hawke's Bay. Talk, talk me through that. Because okay. that's one of the aspects in, in the book. <coughs> on um, those cold, still nights that we get in Hawke's Bay between May and September, what happens is that there is uh, a trapping of all the smoke that comes out of domestic fires beneath what's called an inversion layer. So normally you would expect it to be colder the higher you go, but in this case, the air is trapped, um, if you like, a cloud of smog holds mm. the temperature in and it's called an inversion because it holds it in. And you can see this on a, a still morning. Uh, if you look over Taradale, uh, if you look over certain parts of Hastings as well, you can see this layer and it's a horrible yellowy, mm. browny colour on a clear morning. Um, and that is particulate matter which we'll go on to talk about mm. later on. Um, but it's not healthy. It's very unhealthy. Mm. Mm. Uh, and it's made up of particles called PM10. Now, PM10 is it's sort of vaguely scientific. Um, it's 10 microns in thickness, each particle. Now, how big is 10 microns? It's one-fifth of the width of a human hair. Mm. This is very small stuff. It's smaller than pollen. And this is the damaging... Uh, particulate matter that can get right into the lungs mm. you know, and it does have a health consequence. Because this is the whole point of this isn't it, you know, basically clean air, clear lungs, healthy, healthy person. Absolutely. Um, there are, I mean obviously there are the health benefits but there are the other benefits as well. Um, it's not exacerbating the problems that people have with respiratory conditions who would be frequent flyers at hospital. Um, time off work, time off school is all downtime and it's lost opportunity mm. and 
everybody would like, I think, cleaner air. Mm. And there has been an argument that Hawke's Bay's air is very clean. On a scale, yes, it is good. Um, we don't live in Beijing. Mm. Uh, or Delhi. Or mm. Delhi, or yeah. um, some of the areas that have huge pollution problems. However, on occasions on those inversion layer nights, some of the concentrations of PM10 can be right up there, but we measure over a 24 hour mm. period. So it diminishes the effect a little mm. bit. So obviously inversion layer is something that's covered within this resource for schools. What other sorts of things would the teachers be, be teaching the children? There are a whole range of things, including um, a breakdown of the atmosphere uh, and the gases, solids, liquids, um, how um, you can look at the environment generally and pick out scientific things like photosynthesis. Mm. Um, so a tree mm. converts mm. You know, gases, mm. um, we burn the wood, that produces mm. gases. So there is a cycle of mm. nature that's mm. involved. Um, interestingly in Hawke's Bay, of people's heating choice, about 60% use fires. And that's because I think about 40% of the population that have fires have got access to free yes. firewood. So it's a natural mm. choice mm. of fuel and heating methodology. Over the last three years as the program has mm. been running, we have seen an increase in the number of people that are replacing fires mm. with heat pumps. And that, as a heat pump, is a zero emission. Mm. You don't get any particulate mm. matter. So that's quite good and it's going to help us bring down mm. the number of occasions where we exceed the standard that the government has set yes. in terms of air quality. Mm. And we'll talk about um, heat pumps versus wood burners a little bit later on. Mm. But with, with this program for schools, you know, already having a look at the resource myself, I'd love my year four daughter and my year seven daughter to be exposed to this program. As a parent watching this, how can we go, oh, OK, how do I get this into my children's school? This is mm. available to any school on request. Um, we have piloted it in three schools so far and the resource is online for the schools to use. So if there is anybody that's watching now that would like more information about how to get it into their school mm. for their children, then contact us at HBRC mm. and we will contact the school and provide packs for them. Most of the resource, as I said, is mm. online, but there is a little pack here mm. which you will see uh, that is available as a if you like, an aid memoir mm. for teachers. Oh, I think the, the teacher resource is fantastic mm. because, you know, that's so often, as an ex-teacher, so often go, yes, let's teach this, but then it's like, oh, where do I begin? Mm. And you've basically done it for us, really. It's a guidebook. It's a guidebook, it yeah. is, yeah. yeah. Okay, Mark, coming up in our next segment, we'll have a chat about heat pumps and wood burners. <laughs> that's next. Coming up on Chat Room, I am talking with the Heat Smart Program Coordinator for the Hawke's Bay Regional Council. More from Mark in a moment. Welcome back to Chatroom. Well, Mark, of course, today we are talking about clean air and the Heat Smart program. I think one of your scientists actually really puts it into context on, on the website where it's mentioned that I think we inhale 10 litres of air per minute as opposed to the two litres of water we need a day. So there's definitely an argument that air quality is almost as important, if not more important, than water quality, isn't there? I'd, I'd like to say mm. it was invisible, but it yes. isn't. Yes. Um, the health effects of polluted air are significant. Um, and yes, Kathleen, our air quality scientist, um, used that particular statement, comparing our concern about water and cleanliness mm. with air. And yes, everybody consumes 10 litres a minute thereabouts on breathing. Um, we mentioned earlier on about the particulate matter if that gets into the lungs, it gets into the bloodstream, etc. And the smaller the particles, the further it mm. gets. Mm. Mm. OK, so this resource for schools that we've been talking about tonight it was developed because of the Heat Smart program. Just take us back a little bit and remind us about that. Been going since 2009 and I believe New Zealand's largest program of its kind. I would like to think so, mm. but um, the original impetus and drive for the regional council to take on this issue of air quality uh, and I do have to thank the councillors for continuing to run the program and improve air quality um, was initiated by the Ministry of the Environment way back in 2005 
Mm. And they put the challenge out to regional councils to improve their air quality by installing programs to help people to replace fires that are non-compliant with the standards that the government has set. Now, those standards essentially say that um, a fire should have a certain emission level. And we were very concerned that we had a relatively short period of time with which to achieve the government's targets, and those have to be achieved by 2020. So we phased the least efficient fires out first, and those were the open fires. Open fires were prohibited from use with effect from 2012. Mm. This year, we've gone to the next level and we're taking out the fires from pre-1996. Um, now, as the legislation came in in 2005, any fire that's pre-96 is unlikely to meet the standards as required by the government. So the Regional Council offers a scheme that is partly funded through targeted rates that everybody pays that lives in the airshed, and it's turned into grants and subsidised loans to contribute to the financial cost mm. of replacing an mm. old, inefficient fire. Mm. And actually breaking that down, you know, say for example, a ratepayer decides to take out a $2,000 loan, maybe, you know, replace it with a heat pump. I think it works out at something like 1950 a month. So it does become affordable in, in the way that the council is... The, the is council stopping. was mm. very, very keen to make mm. it as affordable as possible uh, without creating any undue mm. hardship. Now, obviously, the grant is ideal in that it's at the moment $700 that you don't have to pay back and you can knock it off the price of either a heat mm. pump or a fire. That's a contribution mm. towards the cost. The loan that you've described, uh, we have a ceiling of 4500 on that loan. The interest rate is reduced to 3.25% because we pay half the interest as the council. So if you were to borrow the maximum of 4500 it works out at about $10 a week. Mm. And the average install of a fire is coming in at around 3500 mm. So it does make mm. it affordable. And Lots of people mm. are taking advantage of it. Yes, I was going to ask you that. Do yeah. you know how many are taking advantage Absolutely. of it? Absolutely. Um, when we originally set the program up, we estimated that in order to meet the quality target, we would have to replace about 10,000 fires. We're about halfway through the program mm. And thankfully, we're about 5,000 fires mm. uh, that have been replaced. Now, um, we also do insulation, insulation loans as well. But from the fire perspective, it was a relatively slow start. But this year, we've done 2,490 mm. in one year. Mm. So we're ahead of target now. And that's starting to show in the way that the exceedances that we have. It's coming down, isn't it's it? It's coming down. Yay. Uh, but we can talk about that mm. in a moment or two. Um, the, the important thing is that people are aware that something has to be done about the air quality and that the regional council is there to mm. assist them in that process. Because we can just, you know, sit in our little bubble. You know, I've got a wood burner at home. I think I've got another year, two years on it. Mm. And it's working really well seems to be no problems and I'm thinking, ow, you know, I have to replace this. Mm. And a lot of people are saying that to me, why, why do these functioning wood burners have to go? But they're polluting the air, obviously. They are mm. polluting the air. The other thing to consider as well is that with the advance in technology of the manufacturers of the fires, they are becoming far more efficient. Yes. So the net result of that is that you have to burn less fuel mm. to get more heat. Mm. So there is a saving there financially as well. Now, as we said before, 40% have access to free firewood. And one of the key issues is what you're burning on the fire and how well it's burning. Because a smoky fire is an inefficient fire, either because the wood is wet or you're burning the wrong stuff on the mm. fire and it's not giving you value for money on the heat. Because the mm. council, again, has a, a scheme about for dry wood merchants as well. It does. Yeah, so you want less than 25% moisture in your wood? That's correct. If, if you think about it, um, putting, if you imagine your wood pile mm. and look at a quarter of it as being water and you're trying to burn it, 25% mm. you know, moisture content, mm. you've got to drive that moisture out before the fuel will burn efficiently. Now, We've drawn the level at 25%. If you cut wood and it's freshly cut and you try and burn it on the fire, 
that water content is going to be around 40%. Mm. Right? So it's very important that you try and burn dry wood and that you store wet wood appropriately so that it has the opportunity to season, in other words, to evaporate the water out of it. If you've got a fire that's hissing, you've got a fire that's smoking. If you've got a fire that's smoking, you're polluting the atmosphere. Mm. 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 It's as simple as that. Mm. Mm. Now, another issue, Mark, for me, I have to say, and possibly for other people as well, is that, you know, heat pumps are cheaper than, than wood burners. But looking long term, you know, heat pumps use electricity and electricity costs are going up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's another issue with all of this as well. <coughs> yeah. Mm. And power it's, cuts. It's all, <laughs> mm. yes, thankfully not as frequent as they as used Christ to be. As Christchurch too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it is a personal choice. Um, people either choose a fire or a heat pump or a pellet burner or a gas fire according to their needs at the time. Um, a lot of people love a fire. Uh, it's just got an ambience to it. Mm. Um, it smells, it crackles, it's warm, it looks good. Um, so fires will always be popular in Hawke's Bay. As I've said before, about 60% will replace mm. a fire with a fire. The heat pumps, however, have a convenience to them in that you can press a button and you have instant heat. They're not as good for heating a whole house. They tend to heat the room that they're in. But the cost of running a heat pump is very efficient mm. um, for the, you know, the heat that you get out of it. So it is a personal choice. Some people don't like the mess, mm. you know, the hump in the wood, the chop in the wood, the, you know, all the work that's involved in the fire. Some people love the fire. Mm. You know, we don't influence one way or the other uh, what choice they make other than to say, if you're going to have a fire, Please have a compliant Absolutely. One. Yeah. We'll hear more from Mark in our next segment. Let's find out how Hawke's Bay is doing as far as our air quality goes. Welcome back to Chatroom. OK, Mark, tell us how is Hawke's Bay doing as far as air quality goes? I'd like to say that this year is a, a real indicator of how well we're doing, uh, but unfortunately I can't take the credit for the <laughs> weather. Um, the weather this year, this winter, has been incredibly mild. Mm. Um, and as a consequence, we haven't had the same level of exceedances with people burning at night. Um, in 2008, immediately before we started the program, the two airsheds in Hastings and Napier, uh, Hastings exceeded the quality standard set by the government um, on 28 occasions. Napier exceeded on five occasions. Now, this year, mm -hmm. So far, and we're getting towards the end of August now, um, Hastings has had five exceedances and Napier has had one. That's fantastic. That is. That really is good. Unfortunately, I you know, can't mm. take credit on behalf mm. of the programme uh, because it has been a milder winter this year. But it is also, too, I guess, that whole community responsibility that, you know, if we're doing the right sort of burning or heating in the right way, it is actually helping the health of of the whole community, it is. rather than this sort of very insular, well, my, my wood burner's working okay, so why shouldn't I be able to keep it? We've got to look at the bigger picture, don't we? The, the bigger picture is important, and certainly the attitude of the public has changed. Mm. When the programme first started, it was, why have I got to mm. do this? Uh, and then there's been, uh, through education in the programme, and things like mm. the resource kit, an awareness has built about why we have to do it. And also so the to, question now is, when do we yeah, have to do it? Because that's another question, though. You know, a lot of people are saying to me, but why Hawke's Bay? You yeah. know, I've got friends in Whanganui who've still got an open fire, but there's a good reason for that as well, isn't there? There is a good mm. reason, uh, in that certain parts of the country, because of the topography, because of the climate, etc., have more of a problem with air quality and fires than other areas. Mm. Windy Wellington has less of a problem than we do here. Well, they've got to have Australia. something going for them. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> but if you go into central Otago and you look mm. at the basins that exist there around Alexander, etc., they have a huge problem mm. because they do naturally have these inversion mm. layers occurring, which traps the pollution mm. from the fires. Mm. Go to the West Coast. and They have a natural fuel on the West Coast yes. that contributes mm. significantly. Auckland has a minor problem. Canterbury has problems because of the... Uh, topography mm. of the landscape as well. Mm. So Hawke's Bay, we have two areas where we don't meet the standard that was set by the government and those are in the urban areas of Hastings and Napier. So those are the areas that we've targeted 
mm. is the answer. Mm. Because it's interesting to note that I think some cost analysis has been done since Heat um, Smart started, and I think the figure I saw was um, uh, very favourable, a 1.2 billion saving. You know, which when you're thinking about health health benefits and lack of hospital hospitalisation, mm. so it's definitely impacting well. The regional mm. council, in making its decision to run the program, saw this as an investment of yes. resource mm. uh, because the return on the investment is huge. Mm. Um, the quality of life, the health benefits mm. are obvious. Um, the economic benefits of having efficient heating. So this is why we have also encouraged insulation, because if you've got a house full of holes and all the heat's going out, you're, you're heating your neighbours up yes. as opposed to yourself. So we encourage insulation as well, and a combination of efficient heating and insulation reduces the costs on the family Absolutely. bill. Absolutely. Now, another issue, Mark, and obviously it's not the council's problem, but it is an issue, is the fact that you know some landlords and rental properties are, of course, having to remove the wood burner. It's non-compliant and they're not actually putting anything back in. There's been mm. a little bit of interest in the media on this mm. issue. Um, from the point of view of the regional council, we've looked into um, how the scheme runs and our financial contribution is dependent on the replacement of a heat source. Now, theoretically, every home that has a power point has a source mm. of heat because you plug and play, mm. whether it's an oil heater or gas heater, etc. So, while the landlord may remove a non-compliant open fire in order to avoid uh, breaking the law, mm. they are not duty bound to replace it. However, this can cause some difficulties, as you can imagine. Um, I would say that there are good landlords and there are less good landlords. Yes. The same as there are good tenants and less mm. good tenants. Absolutely. Mm. Now, speaking of advice from the Citizens Advice Bureau, for, for people watching tonight who still haven't made a decision, you know, do we, do we replace the wood burner with another wood burner or do we go with a heat pump? You know, wh where is the best place to get advice? I saw Seven Sharp a while ago in Nelson um, City Council, you yep. know, have that wonderful guy that goes out and advises. Yep. Do we have a guy like that here? <coughs> um, Nelson have got a, an initiative that is running and uh, Wanganui have as well where somebody comes out mm. and looks at your property and tells you where you can save money mm. by being more eco-friendly and that's including light bulbs, draft excluders, heavier mm. curtains, mm. thermal drapes, all the rest of it. Um, as far as advice on whether it's a fire or a heat mm. pump, there is a wealth of advice that's available on the ECA website and that's the Energy Efficiency yes. Conservation Authority. We've all seen the ads. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, now, if you go onto their website, you can see cost comparisons on what it costs to run a heat pump compared with the fire, and you can see and get advice from that website that will allow you to make an informed choice on what's best for you. But you can't say that one set of circumstances mm. is good for all. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Gosh, Mark, it's been really interesting to talk to you tonight. Mm. And, um, you know, let's hope just even cleaner air in Hawke's Bay. And uh, good luck with the uh, teaching resource. I'm sure it's going to be widely used. I hope so. Mm. Great to meet you. Okay, nice to meet you. And that brings us to the end of Chatroom. I'll see you again next time.